Are Syrians in the Golan Heights launching a new uprising against Israeli rule? Welcome to Connections, the Arab Studies Institute interview program. I'm Mu'ayn Rabbani, and for this episode, we're delighted to be speaking with Wa'il Tarabe. Wa'il Tarabe is an artist and activist in the occupied Syrian Golan Heights. He's a project manager with Al Marsad, the Arab Human Rights Center in the Golan Heights, where he leads its program on social, economic, and cultural rights. Wa'il Tarabe, it's a real pleasure to welcome you to Connections. Thank you. It's my pleasure also to talk to you through this platform. Thank you. Um, I'd like to start by asking you about uh, the current uh, developments in the Syrian Golan Heights, um, which of course have been occupied by Israel since 1967 and thereafter illegally annexed by it. Um, when and why did the current protests in the Golan Heights erupt and how have they developed uh, since they first uh, erupted? Actually, the last uh, uh, demonstrations and clashes is the latest phase of this big conflict that we are living since more than four years. Actually, four project, years. Yeah, four years. Uh, actually, this project, the wind farm project, is the the the, the, the problem that uh, developed into these latest. Uh, events and and the wind farm project is yeah. a project by the Israeli government to um, build a large number of wind farms on Syrian land in the Golan Heights, basically using um, ecological and environmental pretexts to seize more Syrian land from its uh, inhabitants. Is that correct? Yes, yes. Uh, actually, as you know, it's it's not easy to criticize green energy. Mm -hmm. That's why we need to explain a little bit about the context, why in our situation it became a catastrophe to the indigenous people of the Golan. Actually, this project started a long time ago, uh, um, in 2008, by an Israeli company who developed all the research about the Golan, which have wind all, all over the, the year, so uh, they uh, thought there is a potential to uh, for the ex exploitation of the wind energy. Actually, we, the Syrians, didn't know anything about these plans. And then this uh, the company uh, uh, failed to continue. So another company called Energix bought the company and continue to develop the project. And these are Israeli companies um, that have yes. developed their projects in consultation with the Israeli government and not with the Syrian um, residents of the Golan Heights. Exactly, because they go along with uh, the Israeli policy uh, after they signed the uh, Paris uh, um, uh, Convention on uh, clean energy in, in 2015. So uh, Israelis have plans to turn to clean energy. And within this plan, this project is considered a national project, mm -hmm. but the side we implement is uh, private companies who make contracts with the government in order to put the project into uh, reality. Um, and, and you've spoken about the lack of consultation with um, Syrian communities in the Golan Heights. Have they, um, by contrast, conducted consultations with the illegal Israeli settlements in that occupied territory? Actually, uh, there are some uh, similar projects beside the illegal settlements in the Golan. Some of the settlers also oppose these, these uh, projects. Uh, but you know, uh, for us, it's it's a different different cases. I mean, the way they treat us is is different in all the the, the uh, livings from the settlers, yeah. starting with them from uh, confiscating our lands uh, and the water that we buy our water with money with four times you know more expensive than the settlers do. And they have plans to develop agriculture for settlers and marketing their 
products, etc. So the Zoulani people depend only on themselves. And actually, they cannot compete with the settlers in their own resource of income, I mean, agriculture. Yes. And, and have there been many new land confiscations as part of this wind turbine project? Actually, uh, let's put things to be uh, very precise. The project do not confiscate directly. Mm -hmm. The project comes and are very nice, you know, words, green energy and developing tourism for you, for the Syrians and giving you uh, electricity in which will be uh, cheaper than it was before. So this is the propaganda of the, 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 the project. So but selling I, it as something that is for the benefit of the Syrian communities in the Golan Heights. I think there is no benefit at all. It's destructive for the Syrians in the Golan. And if you have a chance to talk about some details, please do. I can explain. Yeah, uh, actually, actually, this project uh, developed in uh, a discreet way. I mean, they contacted the company, had hired some local agents. And these agents contacted people with lands who, uh, um, who are located in places that the company wants to build turbines on them. And for those who refused, even they um, asked them not to talk about the neg negotiations. Mm -hmm. So, and they also, they made all the studies uh, not consulting the, the, the local community. But in their papers, for example, they had a kind of uh, uh, public opinion about the people in which they asked 114 people, what do they think on green energy? Mm -hmm. But from this number, 100 were tourists who occasionally passed in the, in the Golan. And 14 people reside in the Golan, including settlers and indigenous people. So let's suppose it's half. So they asked seven people from the Syrians uh, who they met in the few stations also occasionally. And the question was, how do you think about clean energy? So everyone would say, it's beautiful. Yeah, we would like Without to providing any of the details. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. So this is the way they, they acted. I yeah. mean, and then when they started to discuss the, the project in the Israeli uh, uh, authorities, uh, you know, they invited five people. The uh, religious leader of Majd al-Shams, of the Jawlani uh, villages, with his son, who is a lawyer, and the son of the religious leader of Masadi village, with his son, and an ex a member in the Israeli Knesset, who is Druze mm -hmm. by religion, but Palestinian and not Syrian, I presume. Yes, he is. Yeah, he's Palestinian from forty-eight. I mm -hmm. mean, with Israeli citizenship. So, so he has no connection to the Golan Heights at all. But mm -hmm. they presented all the people of the Golan Heights, and they asked very strongly that we need this project. It will help us. It will give us uh, labor uh, opportunities for young people, etc., etc. But actually. Later, we discovered that this ex-member in the Knesset has 200 uh, chairs in the company itself. And he was the manager of the implementing company, the daughter company of Energix, which is called- So, so this project would provide him with significant financial gain. For sure. Actually, I can say that this project is well known in Europe and in the West. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, many uh, human rights organizations made uh, very serious research on it, what is called the, the corporate capture. Mm -hmm. And the characteristics of these corporate captures, everywhere actually, uh, they lie on hiring ex-politicians mm -hmm. who worked in governments, who knows many information about the government and who have many connections so once they become managers in these companies, they will use their connections and knowledge in order to, to push uh, it forward. Push it yeah. forward, yeah. yeah. But I want to ask you, um, you're speaking to us from Majd al-Shams, which is the 
um, main and largest Syrian population center today yes. in, in the occupied uh, Golan Heights. Um, you mentioned that this project began in 2008, but these demonstrations that we're discussing today um, began this month. What um, what exactly um, happened? Um, why did these protests erupt uh, at this particular point in time? What developments took place to explain them? Yes, actually, the awareness of this project started in 2018. Mm -hmm. For the first time, people uh, started to ask uh, questions about this, this project. And the first question was about the contract that the farmer signed, some farmer signed with the company. It is a very big, complicated contract in Hepro. Many of the uh, farmers do not know Hepro or read Hepro. And uh, one, one uh, lawyer said that the time for hiring the land is 25 years. It may be, might be dangerous for, you know, for you. It may be for the investor may claim again after 25 years that the land is his. Mm -hmm. So from, from this point, uh, people started to suspect things and to, to learn about it. Uh, uh, in this context, uh, we, uh, we made a kind of local committee mm -hmm. uh, whose, uh, uh, whose aim is to study, to bring information and to distribute information to the locals. This is in 2018. So, yeah, we started in 2018. And within this context, we contacted many Israeli scientists mm -hmm. from the higher level. For example, we brought Dr. Yoval Mental of acoustics, who studied on the ground the impact of the turbines on agriculture and on the people. Also, we had Dr. Hagit Ulanovsky from the Technion, who made uh, research on the impacts on health. We have another doctor from Haifa University on environment. Also, we have Dr. Muna Dajani, who prepared a study on the anthropological aspects of the, uh, this uh, project. And uh, lastly, uh, on agriculture, we had uh, an engineer in agriculture who also prepared. So we prepared all these studies and we used all these studies in the process of objections that happened in Jerusalem. Actually, these projects have a time for people to, to apply to, to uh, uh, provide objections. So we prepared thousands of objections for agricultural corporations, for individuals. Uh, we have signed a big petition that included more than one third of the adult uh, population of the Golan Heights. So we made a very serious work and we hoped that within uh, this track, I mean the legal track, we can stop the project because we have many, many uh, serious arguments and uh, scientific studies that say this is destructive for the local community, for the agriculture, uh, for the health of people. And uh, um, unfortunately, in late 2019, uh, the discussion in the uh, uh, Israeli Committee for Infrastructure, for planning and infra infrastructure in- Within Jerusalem, the Israeli parliament. It's not parliament, it's a committee. It's a government which, committee. Yeah, government committee. And this committee deals with national projects in mm -hmm. order to make the process faster. So, and people attended for the first time in the history of Israel. So many people came in every debate and discussion, old people who do not know Hebrew. They sat from morning to the evening, day after day, hundreds of us, we hired buses to Jerusalem and we hope that we can succeed in this way. Unfortunately, all our arguments was not taken into consideration and they decided that the project is positive to the Israeli economics. So they decided to approve it. Yeah, and, and it's important um, to point out that Israel has illegally annexed um, the Golan Heights and therefore their criteria is not whether such a project um, supports uh, the rights and welfare of the local population, but whether or not it's it, it's good for Israel. 
Exactly. If we, if we will talk on the, the level of international laws, mm. the project is illegal at all. Yes. And, and uh, if you know, uh, in the uh, Madrid Accords in the 90s, when there were uh, starting negotiations with, with Syria on the faith of Golan, there is a, a one small chapter there talking about joint projects that must be done in uh, accordance with both uh, states. Mm. So the Israelis is violating all the, the international law, uh, laws in, in this context. And then the demonstrations erupted this month because? Uh, you, you heard about it this month, but we had two years ago during uh, the uh, COVID-19 closure, mm -hmm. The company used the closure that we cannot attend our lands, and they came with hundreds of policemen mm -hmm. to take samples from the lands in the process of preparing the start of the project. So the and infrastructural then, preparations began. Yeah. So mm -hmm. the people also attended their lands. They standed in their lands, and there were also confrontation and uh, rubber bullets and injured people. But, you know, what's happened we didn't get even to the Israeli media. Mm -hmm. Again, these corporations, also they dominate media and TVs, channels and everywhere. So it was locally talked about. We had more than 10 injured people mm -hmm. at uh, that time. But recently, again, the, uh, the company uh, announced that it's starting the building in the lands. Mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, before I talk about that, there is a very important uh, small Please. detail that mm -hmm. uh, nowadays we are in the Israeli courts. We have a lawsuit against the company that we claim that the company got the permissions on a false documentation mm -hmm. and that there is misleading there or false uh, property documents. This uh, 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 claims are now in the courts. We have about 88 uh, farmers uh, who, un who announced that, for example, this land is mine, and we brought the other whose name in the company's papers, and he said, this is not mine. Mm -hmm. And we are trying to, to, to prove in the court that there is something, there is a mistake here, and this is in the Israelis' laws, by the Israeli, the laws of Israel is also illegal. But they didn't wait until the court gives its final word. So, so they decided so there is, to start. So, so there is an assertion of fraudulent property claims, and yes. the Israeli court did not um, order the company to postpone its uh, activities until after this case is resolved and the company has now begun the construction. Is that right? Yes, we tried to ask uh, the court to um, to order the company to cease until the, the results. But actually this will cost us millions of shekels mm -hmm. that these small villages and these farmers do not have this money. Yeah. We have, you know, this we have to buy millions. I mean, if they delay they work for a month, for example, and we cannot, you know, we don't have this lecture. So, so the construction began and the demonstrations escalated. In the first day, mm -hmm. actually they surprised us. Mm -hmm. You know, the project is not a, a, a secret. It's, it's, it's out in the open. Yeah. yeah, but in early morning, we were surprised of hundreds of police machines. This is who, earlier this month. Yes, mm -hmm. who came to the Golan. They closed all the agricultural area, hundreds of policemen and special forces, with also the group of the, uh, uh, how it's called, the horses for mm -hmm. the, the demonstrations. Yes. And uh, Riot they, control. Yeah, it was like a war. Yeah. And they are coming to a small place with uh, uh, with a small number of people. Actually, the Golan is five small villages. Mm -hmm. All the population, the Syrian population who stayed in the Gol Golan after the ethnic cleansing during 67, now are 28,000 people. That's it. 
I'll, I'll get to that in a moment. Um, but first, these demonstrations erupted. Yeah. Um, and what are the main demands of the demonstrators and how has the Israeli government responded to them? The main demand that to stop the project. To stop the project. Yes, to stop and to move it to, to, to other places. There are many other places, empty places, open places that there also there have wind. And to let these people continue their lives in these small areas that remain in their hands. So the main thing is to start the project, to move it to, to another place. And uh, some, uh, for example, some people, they have to, to widen the roads, for example. And in this process, they will have to confiscate some lands from people who do not have any contract with the company. So this is another violation also. People stand it in their lands and say, I will defend my land as much as I can. Uh, peaceful people, they have nothing. They didn't uh, initiate any violence, but in the first moments, the the gas started to fall on us. Tear and, gas. Mm. Yeah, tear gas and rubber bullets. And it was like uh, a real war against the peaceful uh, demonstration. And there has been some talk that um, the Israeli government um, suggested uh, or committed to postponing construction of this uh, turbine farm until after the upcoming uh, Muslim Eid holidays. Uh, others are saying um, that's a commitment that's been violated and others are saying the commitment is completely irrelevant because it doesn't really matter when this project is built. What matters is if it's built. Actually, it's irrelevant because I think uh, it's a kind of uh, maneuver for absorbing the people's anger. Mm -hmm. uh, let's remember that this time, for the first time maybe, that uh, uh, the uh, Palestinians from 48, from Galilee, demonstrated to support the people of Jolan. They closed main roads in Israel, in North, in, in Galilee, and the main pressure on the Israeli government came from that point, not from the, the uh, demonstrators in the, in the Golan. So uh, I think to absorb their anger and uh, this um, uh, attempt to, to support us, uh, they, um, they said, okay, we will postpone it for after the, the, uh, the holiday. But they didn't uh, uh, solve the, the, the conflict. Um the the Golan Heights are not often in the news. Um, most recently, a few years ago, when the U.S. President Donald Trump decided to officially extend American recognition of this of Israel's illegal annexation of the Golan Heights in the early 1980s, there were of course um, uh, mass demonstrations over Israel's annexation and its. Um, and its campaign to force the Syrian residents of the Golan Heights to um, carry Israeli identity cards. Can you put these latest developments in the broader context of Israeli policy in the uh, Golan Heights since 1967 and of resistance to this policy by um, uh, the Syrian residents of this ter occupied territory? Yeah, sure. I agree with you that the, the uh, this context is very uh, important and it's not uh, um, enough known or talked about or written about. Mm -hmm. Actually, the Golan Heights uh, um, in 1967, in the eve of the, the war, was populated with 157,000 Syrians. And those Syrians represent the whole ethnic fabrics in, the, in Syria. I mean, Muslims, Christians, uh, uh, Turkmenes, and all the, these fabrics that we know in Syria was in the Golan. Uh, within a few weeks, only 6,400 people remained in the Golan. And this is in June, July 1967? Yes, 
All so these the population was reduced by Israel from over 150,000 to 6,000. Yes. And in Golan Heights, there were 340 villages and farms, plus two cities. All, all these places were ethnically cleansed, people were uprooted, and the Israeli occupation in the first week started to demolish and destroy all the villages. So not to give the Syrians an opportunity to come back because many of them after the war tried to come back. They arrested them for a while and then they, re they re released them to go to Syria. So this is the, the way how the, the Golan was ethnically cleansed. But even this term, ethnic cleansing of the Golan was not used until 1991. And the Israeli propaganda was that people fled by themselves and went to Syria and didn't come back. Actually, Dr. Israel Shahak is a human this rights- The late uh, Israeli uh, uh, human rights activist. Yes, mm -hmm. and he's the one who, uh, uh, the first maybe who uh, uh, made the first uh, human rights organization in Israel. Mm -hmm. He wrote an article in 1991, and he tells very interesting story that was published, uh, that was uh, screened in TV. And shortly about this story, says that two soldiers uh, had a mission to evacuate one Syrian house. So they come to the house and they gave 60 minutes to the people to get whatever they can within this short time and to leave the house. The story tells how soft these soldiers were with the Syrians, but in the time they waiting for the family to get out of the house, one of them told the other, he said, I will tell you what will happen. If they have a kid, the bigger one will get out first. He said, okay. And he will have a bag or something in his hands. And this something, if you open it, you will have the most expensive things, money, gold, jewelry, anything. He said, okay, let's see. And then really, when they got out, a kid of 14 years old had a bag. The soldier asked him to open the bag and they found the jewelry of the mother and some money. And they let them go to Syria, for sure. Then the second soldier asked, how did you know that? He said, I was that kid hmm. when we were in Poland, when the Nazi came to us. Hmm. So actually, uh, this, uh, this story was deleted at that time and uh, Israel Shahak wrote about it. And from that point, people started to say ethnic cleansing happened in the Syrian Golan it, it sounds very similar to um, Israel's campaign of ethnic cleansing in Palestine in 1948. And, and another aspect is, of course, today, um, uh, people are often discussing the exponential expansion of Israeli settlements in the West Bank. But if I'm not mistaken, the first settlement in occupied territory after 1967 was actually built in the Golan Heights and not in the Palestinian territories. Is that correct? That's correct. The mm -hmm. first settlement was built uh, just two weeks after the occupation. Mm -hmm. Actually, they took the stones of the destroyed Syrian houses and started to build the first settlement in the Golan. And the policy of building settlements was to start from the nearest place to the Syrians mm -hmm. and to keep the whole Golan behind empty for future development. Mm -hmm. So to get as close, closer as, as possible to the Syrian. To try to establish a new border, essentially. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. And, and I think this clearly shows that Israel's intention towards the Golan Heights um, from the very outset in 1967 through ethnic cleansing and, and, and settlement construction and so on um, was permanent control. And in the early 1980s, this resulted in the formal annexation and the campaign to impose um, uh, what do you call it? Israeli identity cards yes. on the yes. land residents. And this resulted in a mass campaign of civil disobedience, which went on, I think, for for many months. Yes, for about six months. 
Mm-hmm. Actually, uh, uh, for our um, uh, friends to know that Israel relies on Golan in water, for example. Yeah. That's why it want to cement its capture on the Golan. 30% of the clean water is from the Syrian lands, from the Golan Heights. Uh, and uh, uh, during the, the first 14 years, from 1967 until 1981, uh, the Syrians lived under military rule. Mm-hmm. So we have a general from the Israeli army, and the general decided everything for the people for 40, 14 years. In a military years, government, yeah. like in the yes. West Bank and Gaza Strip exactly. at the time. Exactly, yeah. exactly. In 1981, yeah, uh, uh, they decided the annexation of the Golan. And this decision at that time made the, those people who were forgotten, forgotten totally, even in Syria, mm-hmm. they didn't talk about those people who remained under occupation because they considered that the war of 1970 and taking 73, back Kone- 73 sorry, and taking Konetira back, about 50 kilometers the Syrian took back from the occupied and Golan. And Konetira was prior to 67, the main city in the Golan Heights, no? Yes, the capital of the Golan. Yeah. And they took it destroyed totally. So in the awareness of Syrian people that, okay, the, we liberated the Golan from occupation and that's it. Mm-hmm. And we were forgotten for all these years. In 1981, after what the Israeli annexation and the demonstrations that happened in the Golan and all the tough things that we passed through, I mean, the closure of the, the villages, and the thousands of soldiers who came to every house, they knocked every door and they proposed the Israeli citizenship identity card for everyone. And they arrested people who refused to take it. And there was a mass campaign of civil disobedience at the time. Yes, yes. And six months, the people stayed at home. Mm. Uh, At the end, when the closure was uh, and the people gathered these identity cards in the in the yards and they burned it. It's what a simple act to say that we will not change our citizenship. We are Arab Syrians and we will stay Arab Syrians. We want we will not we do not agree to become Israelis. Mm-hmm. Um turning now to um the current realities, um the Golan Syrians, or at least um, those Syrians who still remain in the occupied Golan Heights, are primarily of the Druze faith. And there is also a significant uh, Druze community within the Green Line. Have Golan Syrians developed relations with Palestinian Druze um, and others inside the Green Line to promote their struggle? You know, actually, the Druze in the Golan and in 48, they had family relationships even before the establishment of the Israeli state. I mean, Palestine, Lebanon, Syria, yes, all together. And all the time, these families and these marriages from each other continued. But on the political level, uh, uh, all the time, the, the Syrian Druze uh, tried to make a kind of recognition to, to, I mean, to say that, okay, our uh, religious identity is truth, but it's not our priority. We are yeah. Syrians, we are Arabs, and we are truth. So mm-hmm. politically, we are separated from them. And yeah. the truth in Israel have their own story. Mm-hmm. I mean, before the, the establishment of the Israeli state and after, so uh, politically we are different, but in this case lately, I mean in this uh, last week, what happened was surprising to the Israeli Israelis themselves, because you know the Jews in Israel they serve in army, they are Israeli citizens, but despite all the the sacrifice that they gave to the in, in Israel's war and hundreds of their young men who were killed in Israel's war, the confiscation of the Druze lands is higher than the confiscations of the other Palestinian Arabs. So there's a strategic location. 
Mm. Yes. Yeah. So they are they gave everything to the Israeli state. They were separated from Palestinian, their people, Palestinian people. And there were uh, 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 plans of brainwashing for 70 years for all the Jews that you are not Palestinians, you are Jews. And also they tried in the Golan Heights, they, for example, in the first week of the occupation, uh, they decided that the Syrian curriculum is forbidden in the Golan Heights immediately. And they created- and, and the, the, This is the, the, the Israeli campaign to try to transform the Druze identity from a um, faith to a nationality. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. And everybody knows the Druze is a sect from the Islam mm -hmm. everywhere. In, in the Middle East, but in Israel it became a nationality. Yeah. And for us, those who rejected the Israeli citizenship, they wrote uh, in our uh, travel document, uh, nationality is undefined. Hmm. So we are- Which, which is an achievement uh, in, uh, in, well, in this context, it's an achievement. Yes. Yeah, really, really. That, that's as far as um, the Jewish community in, in within the Green Line is concerned. Um, separately, have you also received support from Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza Strip, given um, uh, greater similarities perhaps uh, with your own circumstances because they also live under a military annex annexationist uh, regime? Um, actually, all over the years of occupation, our relations with Palestinians who are not Jews were stronger than with the Jews on the political level. So uh, we had support all the time from Palestinians, even during the strike in the Golan. The only side, the only in eighty-one, people, yeah, 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 eighty-one. The yeah. only people who supported us with medicine uh, with food with milk for kids during the strike was the palestinians from all over palestine and and this reflects the similar circumstances um sure yeah. sure because our struggle is the same and i'd like now to look at this from a more international perspective um as you know several years ago the united states took a decision to formally recognize the Israeli annexation of uh, the Syrian Golan Heights. And to the best of my understanding, um, that was done by Trump and the Biden administration has maintained that illegal um, position. At the same time, most European governments, while they don't recognize the annexation, they deal with it as a de facto reality. For example, by allowing um, the entry of illegal settlement products uh, into into their markets. Um, recently, the number of Israeli settlers in the Golan Heights for the first time surpassed the number of Syrians in the territory. Yes. Do you consider, and in light of, of, of these realities, do you consider the West complicit in Israel's illegal occupation and annexation of the Golan Heights? And what can the international community do to confront these Western policies? Um, I can say that the Israeli lobbying efforts are making success everywhere, especially in the West. So uh, yes, uh, for example, the Golan, uh, let's, uh, I'll give one um, um, Sample. Uh, sample. Uh, uh, in the uh, UN uh, uh, reports every year, uh, there are reports on the uh, uh, condemnation of the expansion of settlements in Palestine. Mm -hmm. But the Golan Heights was not mentioned. Until recently, we succeeded in Al Marsat with our uh, another uh, human rights organization in Palestine and in Europe and in the US. And Marsad, the human rights organization in the Golan Heights that you work with. Yes. So we succeeded for the first time to add and in the occupied Golan Heights. So it was not mentioned even in the documentation. And I think uh, we are a small part that is, is forgotten every way, mm -hmm. everywhere. Uh, for example, since, you know, since the 
this is my own opinion. Uh, since the Zionism was considered non-racist and non-chauvinist movement, uh, many things changed even on the level of the Palestinian cause. And after that, uh, uh, Israel lobbying succeeded in many, in many countries, for example, in Europe, to, uh, uh, to, to, to convince the, 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 these governments to consider any criticism to Israel. As anti-Semitism, yeah. Yes, yes. So, and even the most irony, when in the UN, uh, Israel was nominated to uh, reside the Committee for Decolonization. Yes. I think this explains everything. So the last uh, settler colonial, colonial uh, 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 how it's called? Uh, it's, it's, it's putting the wolf in charge of the sheep. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> the, the, the construct itself. I mean, so yeah, from in, in this sense, I think yeah, the, the West, uh, not maybe not the complicit in, in intentionally, but uh, uh, in fact, yes, the Israeli interests are above all the other people, regardless of the, the violation they are. Speaking of um, putting arsonists in charge of the fire department, I now like to ask you finally a broader question and I, I don't want to discuss the conflict the tragic conflict in, in in Syria as such but to take one aspect of it which is that since 2011 many western governments have claimed to be passionately supporting the human rights of the Syrian people in the context of of this uh, conflict and and the numerous human rights violations that have taken place there um, and they've imposed severe sanctions as you know on the Syrian government yet at the same time they're notoriously silent when it comes to the human rights of Syrians who live under Israeli rule um, and have refused to take any measures in defense of the rights of Syrians when those violating their rights are Israelis uh, rather than Syrians. Um, from your perspective in Masjid al-Shams and the Syrian uh, Golan Heights, how do you assess these Western policies? Uh, well, actually, I think all the principles of sanctions, yeah, uh, generally, uh, is, is unfair. First yes. of all, it's the action of the superpowers. They decide what we on who to punish to punish, and it's not uh, a consensus in the uh, international community. And secondly, the Syrians, the people, simple people who are uh, suffering from the sa sanctions, the Syrian regime developed a new economy of Kiptagon, is making well and living well, but the people are starving up till now. Regarding us, uh, this detail may be significant. Here in the occupied Golan Heights, for many years, people are gathering uh, uh, money and we are sending uh, some money to our brothers and families in Syria to support them in their everyday life. Because even the basic things they cannot uh, uh, receive there. So uh, yes, the Golan Heights is, is forgotten. And for in, in many cases, I think the Golan Heights was used by both the Syrian regime and the, 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 the West as, uh, as some cards for negotiations and forgotten for the Syrian regime itself. I think the main thing is to, to keep the power, but uh, do not uh, give attention to the people of the Golan Heights. And when even, you know, now we have Trump uh, height in the Golan, new settlement, yes. it's called yes. Trump height. Actually, the Trump announcement uh, uh, um, uh, was not adopted by other countries. Mm -hmm. The Golan Heights is still, by the international law, considered an occupied Syrian land. Mm -hmm. So, but it's not mentioned. And also, uh, to be honest, we are not suffering in our lives, like the Syrians or like right. the Palestinians in, in the West Bank. Mm -hmm. So we are a small uh, community uh, and we have a high level of education. So uh, uh, we are managing our life better than other occupied uh, places.
But have any of the governments who have spoken out about human rights in Syria um, during the past 10 years, are you aware of any statement by any of them um, supporting the demonstrations, the recent demonstrations against um, uh, this project or any expression in support of your human rights? You mean uh, in the region or generally? Well, uh, generally, but particularly from those who have the loudest megaphones, and here I'm referring to governments like the United States, um, the European Union, and so on. They've been very loud about human rights in Syria, um, but are you aware of any statement they've made supporting the human rights of Syrians when they happen to live in the in the Golan Heights, as opposed to under um, the rule of their repressive government. Actually, uh, we had uh, uh, in Al Marsad, we had contacted uh, uh, most of the uh, UN committees and the EU, and we sent many letters to the EU regarding this project. And as you know, uh, the companies from Europe who uh, collaborate with the Israelis who produce the turbines, also they are making a violation because this is an occupied land. Actually, we don't know until now which company is the one because this is a secret in some, some way. But uh, yes, we try to, to, um, uh, to contact, to make contacts, but political uh, announcement official, we didn't hear. Nothing. Um, nothing, yeah. And that's very interesting. You're saying um, until today, the identity of those who are producing the materials for this illegal project are unknown. And I think it's probably a fair assumption um, that they're located somewhere in Europe. We are sure that they are, they are from Europe and we know there are three or four options, one of them. But here uh, in the uh, all the publications of the project, they do not mention the, uh, the partner from Europe. Wael Tarabe, thank you very much for sharing your insights and expertise with Connections. It's been a fascinating discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. It was my pleasure.